night. Welcome to the Binate stage, everyone. Thanks for that introduction. My name is Jordan French. I'm a reporter at thestreet.com. With me is Liz Schuler, AFL-CIO, American Federation of Labor. And also with us today is Dr. Frida Polly, the Billy Bean of AI. Uh, Pymetrics <laughs> is our company. We are on the gender bias in AI. Uh, in that talk, uh, I observed on my way over, there is some discrimination on this stage already. In fact, AI is not present to defend itself. <laughs> with that, let's let the roasting begin. Liz, you told me you have some real con grave concerns about unbridled AI. Tell us about it. Sure, and again, I'm Liz Schuler. The AFL-CIO is an umbrella organization of 55 different unions representing 12 and a half million working people in the US and all different sectors of the economy. I just want to make sure everyone knows that, first of all. Um, and yes, I think people would assume that if you have a labor union representative on this couch that uh, we would be fearful of technology, that AI is um, something that's going to displace millions of jobs, and there's a lot of narrative around um, what we should be afraid of. Um, there is that, yes, but we also uh, believe AI is a tool that can be used for good, especially if we make the right choices. And with inequality on the rise, um, you know, people, people's jobs at risk, these are the choices we need to be making as a society now, is how do we deploy a tool alongside humans, right, to make sure that we're enabling and empowering working people um, and readying them for the disruption that is about to come. Dr. P, for people who don't know that much about Pymetrics, tell us what you do. Sure. So, hi, I'm Dr. Polly, uh, also known as Dr. P. Um, uh, Pymetrics uses uh, behavioral neuroscience and artificial intelligence machine learning to help companies hire in a more predictive and less biased way. Mm -hmm. Great. So where can that be deployed? Tell mm -hmm. us about what you're doing today. Yeah, sure. Um, so like Liz, I also feel that AI, it's really about how you're using it, how you're designing it. I think it has potential to do harm. Um, but I think it also has potential to do real good, and I think it just really depends on the design. Um, and that's obviously up to the creators of machine learning algorithms to really be intentional about their design. And so the way that we use it, or the way that it's currently used um, when a company deploys Pymetrics is that we are a replacement or an augmentation for uh, the first screening that a company normally does, which is the resume review. And as we know, unfortunately, um, resume review as done by humans is unfortunately biased. It's biased against women, it's biased against people of color, it's biased against people of different socioeconomic uh, statuses. So currently the situation right now is not great. And we had this conversation earlier that you know, while AI can certainly make things worse, I don't think that the situation right now is, is that amazing. Um, and so what we aim to do um, is really make the hiring, pro make that first pass matching where 75% of people are getting cut from further consideration at that resume phase, um, we try to make that matching uh, free of any kind of bias. We audit all of our algorithms to make sure that gender and ethnic bias um, is not in there. And by default, socioeconomic status isn't either because we don't have any demographic information about people and we don't use any resume data. Um, but then also to make that matching more predictive, which kind of leads us into the discussion of how can AI help with the displacement of people from these types of jobs over here that are being automated away to these types of jobs over here which are coming online and which are growing and how can artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms really help increase the efficiency, the speed of the matching so that this so-called skills gap, um, which is real, um, can be addressed in a more technology-enabled way so that we can move everyone from you know, the jobs of the past to the jobs of the future and avoid the you know, cataclysm of universal basic income, which is you know, sort of the catch-all or the, the thing that everyone likes to point to as to what the future, the dystopian future could be, basically. Liz, so, right. working with your constituents, you see discrimination. You hear the complaints every day. How bad is it? Well, as uh, Dr. P said, <laughs> um, it's not a perfect world we live in. We are just seeing discrimination, um, as, as you mentioned. Um, two 
things I might bring forward that weren't mentioned. Um, one is people who are unemployed. Um, often algorithms tend to sort people out if they've got gaps in employment. And so if you're unemployed and you become chronically unemployed for one year, two years, as we've seen through the recession you know, a few years yeah. ago, um, it makes it more and more difficult for people to find jobs. Yep. Um, secondly would be returning citizens who uh, have served their time, often for nonviolent um, crimes that, um, as we know in California, for example, with Prop 47, finally were able to remedy uh, to get those folks back into the workforce. Um, we're seeing, obviously, that you know being a barrier to entry when people have felonies on their records for things yep. that are very low-level crimes. Yep. And so the union movement actually has been a tool to helping people re-enter um, through training and workforce development yep. and help, helping people actually with that skills gap yep. um, to make sure that they're accessing good jobs. Because that's all we want. I think we all agree yep. that people should have access to good employment with decent benefits um, and a way to provide for their families. And so uh, any tool we can use to actually help avoid discrimination or those barriers to entry, we're, we're in favor of. Sure. Now on the topic of tools, artificial intelligence typically is considered something programmed by a white man in Silicon Valley. Dr. Polly, how is what you do different? Um, I think it's not necessarily, well, I think that what we have done is create a system that is intentionally designed not only to be more predictive than a typical um, natural language pro uh, NLP process on a resume, um, but also more... Uh, basically free of the types of biases that we see. And so what I mean by that is that we, the, the data that we collect was intentionally designed um, to have as little gender, ethnic, and certainly no socioeconomic bias in it. Um, as a result, the ability to audit algorithms and produce algorithms that are lacking in bias is a lot easier than if you start off with um, data sets such as the type of things you might see on a resume, which are inherently biased. And we were talking about this the other day. Like, if you look at extracurricular activities on a college resume, there are not a lot of women that play football. There's not a lot of guys that do ballet, right? So by definition, if you're starting off with a data set, and people use that, right? Oh, you were a football player. You must have the, you know, this must mean this about you. You're a ballerina. This means that. People do that all the time when they're reading a resume, right? So if you start off with a data set that is, by definition, tough to unbiased, you're kind of... It, you're at a disadvantage already in terms of creating algorithms that are going to be more diversity friendly. So we did intentionally create a system um, that would be amenable to auditing for bias, if that makes sense. We'll let the audience be the judge of, the judge of that. If you could, uh, because I don't think anyone else has had a chance to unpack what mm -hmm. actually sure. are the mechanics yeah. of going yeah. through your system. Sure. Uh, tell us about that. Tell us sure. what the life cycle and the journey is for a given applicant. Sure. And again, this is, you know, taking it out of the realm of Pymetrics and bringing it into, we belong to a broader class of new technologies that are coming online that are using different types of data to understand people in a more complete way. Um, but essentially what we do, my background is I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, and cognitive neuroscience as a field has, has developed... Um, a whole bunch of basically computer activities that you can do that will tell you something about different cognitive traits and different emotional traits. It's not an IQ test. It's much more, think about it like a Harry Potter sorting hat that either end of the spectrum of these cognitive or emotional traits could be adaptive. It just depends on the role that you're thinking about. So, for example, um, we have a test that looks at how attentive you are. One end of the spectrum is you're really attentive, really good attention to detail, probably really good for accounting, let's say. Other end of the spectrum is you're less attentive to detail. That's actually been shown to be really good for um, any kind of occupation that's really, uh, you have to be creative, right? So we put people through 20, 25 minutes worth of computer activities that will tell us something about um, their cognitive and emotional aptitude, and that data is then used instead of or in addition to a resume to make this initial, uh, fil initial decision-making um, more predictive and less biased. And when we've worked with companies who have used our tool, um, instead of a resume, the, the advantages they've seen in terms of diversity have been tremendous. So Unilever is a client of ours, and they replaced the resume with this system. And not only did they see gender and ethnic improvements, but they also saw just much, much wider slate of socioeconomic uh, uh, 
diversity, which is something that we don't even think about sometimes when we talk about diversity, is how do we include people that are not from, you know, sort of the, you know, upper middle class backgrounds. And I think that that, you know, kind of speaks a lot to what you do, which is that um, how can, you know, we need to make any tool that we use in the workforce inclusive to everybody across the economic spectrum. And I think that these newer predictive tools really have the the capacity to do that. Because if you think about it, if you're reviewing a resume, unfortunately, like if you went to you know, some fancy school versus community college, nobody even thinks about that as, in quotes, bias or discrimination. You're just making a smart decision. You're hiring a smart person over, you know, whatever. And I think that that's not necessarily the way we should be thinking about people. There are tons and tons of people that don't have the educational opportunities that some of us have had that have nothing to do with their inherent abilities and all to do with their socioeconomic uh, you know, situation, so. Certainly, and Liz, while new tools sound good, particularly AI, is it possible that these are just another way to discriminate against suspect classes? I mean, you do kind of, as, you're, as I'm listening to you, wonder, yes, your company has all the right intentions, yep. and, you know, you do um, a, a great job of, um, you know, on the development side of, yep. of keeping these things in mind, but not all companies do. Yep. And so we absolutely do worry that um, if there's not a set of standards yeah. or norms or, um, you know, a code that we can all um, depend on yeah. uh, that makes it reliable and transparent yeah. and, yeah. Um, you know, so and, I guess we worry about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I agree with you. And I th yeah. But I think that there are all sorts of initiatives out there um, like FAT ML, which is Fairness and Accountability and Transparency in Machine Learning and others, right, mm -hmm. where people are really, and these are, you know, and people like Sergey Brin and John Jen Andrea, who's AI, uh, Google's AI chief, have really come out um, and, and highlighted the problem of biased training sets, biased data, biased yes. algorithms. So I do think that there's an increasing focus on this. Um, I agree with you. A set of standards is probably would, would be amazing. I think we would all benefit from that because then we could we could all benefit from that. Um, but I think there is a lot of. I mean, I was at a talk earlier today where they were sort of saying the same thing. Where um, you know, sort of transparency and accountability is kind of critical to a lot of how technology should be developed. And I think with all of the recent sort of tech issues that have been in the news, I think there's a stronger and stronger desire from the public in general right. to have that accountability and transparency. So and to maybe have we'll a, see more of that. Like a multi-stakeholder yep. kind of process yep. that we could all talk to each other. Yep. I think that's one thing that I noticed being in this space, which you know you don't see many labor unions at these kinds of conferences, right? There's often not a worker perspective yep. um, at the table. Um, let alone, you know, other stakeholder perspectives in yeah. civil society, for example, that probably could bring a lot of insights and yeah. um, in developing yeah. those norms. Exactly. And I mean, yeah. look, I think technology is always going to have bumps in the road. It's never going to be, you know, like, I, I don't think that the ethics or the, or the governance should be like to catch someone in, you know, sort of like right. an oops mistake moment, but it's really to, to sort of, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of issues that come out of technology development that are, um, you know, that are people not designing things with these types of issues even in entering right. their consciousness. And I think that's what, you know, we're trying to, I think that's what ethics could really help with. So. Right, the unintended consequences. Yep. And, and Liz, the, and for you, Dr. Polly, too, Silicon Valley optically is known for having problems with hiring. Do you see that changing? Wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, not from not my vantage spot, point. But. Yeah, right. And, you know, in terms of the tech sector especially, it's not a sector that has a lot of labor movement influence. So um, we're definitely seeing um, the patterns, generally speaking, and I would say with women in the workforce, you know, lacking access um, to uh, hiring and promotions and, you know, the pay equity issues, the pay gap that still exists in this country um, is, is ever present, and I assume that it is actually bigger in tech. Um, I don't have data on that, but you might know better. But certainly, the biases we're seeing in hiring contribute to that, right? That women aren't in the pipeline. Women aren't at the table to access those leadership positions to be in the position to hire people. Um, so that's, I think, what, what we're seeing. Yeah, and I think, I think you know, I think the narrative around artificial intelligence has generally been a negative one. And, you know, especially in the press, it's either going to take your job or it's going to discriminate against you. 
um, or it's, you know, somehow negative, right, that, that it's really not going to create a more utopian future. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's unfortunate because whenever we've seen it deployed, um, it's actually had the opposite uh, effect, right? And so I think it does come down to, um, I mean, we were talking about this earlier that, you know, there's been tons of um, implementation of unconscious bias training in, in humans, right? So there's been a lot of companies that have implemented this. And there's a woman at Harvard named Iris Bonet who, um, and, and others who have really studied, does this work? And the answer, sadly, is no, it really doesn't work. And, you know, unfortunately, men, women, we all have biases. Women are just as biased as men and, unfortunately, don't do a better job of hiring women. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if unconscious bias training of humans doesn't work, then what could help, right? And that's where I think that if you have a technology um, that is designed to intentionally be like a blind audition, like we did for orchestras, you know, you know, 50 years ago, that actually improved the representation of women in orchestras from 5% to 35%. Mm. If we could have that type of technology in the format of an algorithm that has pretested to not have any of these discriminatory human biases, it actually could be a great, um, you know, mitigator of some of the of some of the, you know, challenges that humans face. Um, and so again, I'm not arguing that. AI should re- replace humans at all. It's a tool, to Liz's point, that can be used in addition to many other tools and the input of human beings um, to move us in the right direction when it comes to more inclusive hiring. So I guess During the hope this, is... though, it, it does conflict uh, because you yeah, are saying that, that humans are the problem. Uh, back I don't think days, I'm saying it. I think that there's just like lots of evidence out there um, that that's true. I mean, I'm a problem. I have biases. I'm, I'm not saying problem. you, I'm not saying you, I'm saying I, right? And so I think, but I think we need to just be aware of this. There was a woman who spoke on the stage yesterday who said the exact same thing. I'm forgetting her name, but she basically said the exact same thing. And it's just because to be human is to have biases. And so I think, unfortunately, when we talk about biases, we try to, we like to point the finger towards people that are not in disadvantaged groups. But unfortunately, that's not the case, right? I mean, women, the data shows, are not much better at, at removing their biases when it comes to hiring women. So... I am the problem as much as anyone else, and all I'm trying to say is that we should avail ourselves of all of the tools out there to ensure that we are not um, making those decisions. And quite frankly, ever since I've become, I used to be a neuroscientist, I didn't used to think about these things at all. Um, Ever since I started working on this, I really have started to catch myself and think, like, think much more heavily about am I, what are my own biases in this? And just to to wrap up, uh, Dr. P, you told me that sometimes uh, your programs will reject applicants. Is there a scenario where it will reject all of the applicants in favor of itself, the AI or robots? Right. The AI will just take over everything, yeah. I don't know, we haven't, that's very far-fetched. I think that's right up there with Elon Musk's, uh, you know, warmongering. Uh, so you it's know. coming. We want to organize. I don't think it's coming, but. <laughs> we want to organize the AI into unions. <laughs> Give them more go. power. There you go. Right. If only, if only <laughs> that's the AI happened, then AI is exactly. Liz is there to unionize them. Yes, yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. That wraps up our panel. Hope you found it fascinating. <laughs> One of the most riveting here at Collision today. Thank Dr. you. P- Dr. Frida Polly, Liz Schuler, AFL-CIO. Appreciate it.